es un placer. Estoy empezando en español para seguir en inglés en un momento más. Es un placer tener el inicio de esta serie de conferencias para dirigirla a... Oigo un eco. Eh, es una ocasión espléndida para comunicar a colegas que está en el área de ecología, a estudiantes, a profesores, tanto de habla inglesa como de habla en española, esta serie que no podía tener un mejor inicio y un mejor, una mejor persona inaugurándolo que el profesor Charles Krebs, que es verdaderamente una institución en el área de la ecología, de la ecología de poblaciones, de la relación entre poblaciones, animales y, y ecosistemas. Eh, yo estoy seguro que él y los colegas que van a participar darán una serie de puntos de vista realmente de mucho interés. Good afternoon. Uh, it is my very, very special pleasure to introduce this series of lectures that are being organized by CONAVIO, the Mexican National Commission on Biodiversity, under the organization of Dr. Carlos Galindo, an uh, alumni of British Columbia, of the University of British Columbia. Uh, and he was able enough to obtain the, uh, the presence of Professor Charles Krebs, whom is truly one of these particularly well-known, particularly important, uh, I would use a, a, a word that is used in the area of Oh, oh, that area of Canada is a really a totem in, in, in ecology and who else better than him to, uh, to start this series on issues of uh, ecology, population ecology, animal ecology and ecosystems. So uh, once again, Professor Grebs, My gratitude, it is an honor to have you starting this series of talks. And uh, I am very sure that it's going to be a real bonus for a lot of people to have this series of, of talks. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Sarukan. I will do a brief introduction in Spanish for the seminars and I will continue in English. Bienvenidos todos a la primera conferencia de la serie de seis charlas titulada Los Ecólogos de Krebs, Regulación de Poblaciones Animales. Las charlas serán en inglés y las presentaciones en español para que sea más fácil seguirlas. Posteriormente traduciremos las charlas en español y estarán disponibles en el sitio de la Conavio de YouTube junto a la versión en inglés. Si quieren hacer preguntas, pueden escribir su nombre en Facebook, su lugar de procedencia y sus preguntas que se atenderán al final de la charla. La ciencia de la ecología es la base para la conservación, manejo y restauración de la biodiversidad. Esta serie de seis charlas está integrada por cuatro líderes canadienses de la ecología animal. El doctor Charlie Krebs, a quien muchos conocemos por sus excelentes libros de texto y por tres de sus estudiantes que han sido sus colegas durante muchos años, Judy Myers, Stan Button y Rudy Bonstra, todos ellos líderes en su campo. Tuve la oportunidad de conocerlos durante mis estudios de maestría y doctorado que inicié hace apenas 40 años y ahora realmente es un gran honor y una oportunidad única poder escucharlos. 
Estos dedicados investigadores han avanzado el campo de la ecología animal y se distinguen por lo menos por cuatro cualidades que podrán notar. Primero, tienen un gran compromiso en la investigación y en la educación. Segundo, son mentes sumamente críticas. Tercero, utilizan un enfoque experimental en el campo, lo cual es muy complejo en la ecología. Y cuatro, sus proyectos son de largo plazo. Gracias a esto, han, han hecho grandes avances. Hemos creado una página web que van a estar viendo en el Facebook con sus biografías y los enlaces a sus publicaciones para que los conozcan mejor. Welcome everyone to the first conference of the series of six seminars. Uh, entitled Krebs Ecologist on Animal Population Regulation. The talks will be in English, the presentations in Spanish. We will, will upload the English version and translations to Spanish later on to our Conavio YouTube site. If you have any questions during the seminar, you write your name, location, and question in Facebook, and we will have a short session at the end of the talk. The science of ecology is the basis for the conservation, management, and restoration of biodiversity. In this series of conferences, four leading Canadian ecologists will share an overview of their research. Charles Krebs, to whom many of you know from his amazing ecological methods textbooks, and three of his former students and colleagues during many years, Judy Myers, Stan Butin, and Rudy Boonstra, all of them leader in their fields. I had the opportunity to spend time with them during my master's and PhD uh, work in Canada just uh, about 40 years ago. And now it is a great honor and a unique opportunity to hear them. This group of researchers are distinguished for at least four characteristics. They have a great commitment to research and education. They have amazing critical minds. Their approach of using a field experimentation, which is very difficult in ecology and their long-term research projects. Thanks to these characteristics, they have made amazing contributions to the science of ecology. We have created a web page on the seminars with links and presentations where you can get to know them better. And now I'm proud to introduce our first speaker, Charlie Krebs. Dr. Krebs is Emeritus Professor at the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He has written over 300 scientific papers and nine or 10 books on ecology and ecological methods. For me, it is a great honor to have him with us and I greatly appreciate his immediate positive response to organize this series. I'm sure that everyone will enjoy his talk. Welcome, Charlie, and we are very grateful for being here with us. The screen is yours. Thank you. Let's see, share the screen. Now, which one do I want? This one. Share. Now I go to this one. There it is. Thank you, Professor Sarah Khan and Kirk Carlos, and, uh, and thank you for the invitation. I'm greatly honored. What I want to do today is to talk to you uh, and welcome everyone, but I want to talk to you about population regulation. There are really two reasons for this. Population ecology is probably the best developed of all of the ecological sciences, and I think seeing how it works in action is very important. And within population ecology, uh, uh, which is so essential, of course, for conservation, within population ecology, the issue of population regulation is absolutely crucial for, for all of us, for all the animals and plants of the earth. So what I want to do just to start with is tell you something very briefly that, that, that I'm not going to talk about, and that is the statistical methods, the ecological methods, the mathematical methods which people have developed. If you were alive 100 years ago and you wanted to know how many white-tailed deer you had in a certain region of Mexico or how many other, uh, well, volcano rabbits that, that occur right outside of Mexico City, how many are there? You wouldn't be able to do that, but because of a lot of very clever mathematicians, ecologists, statisticians, 
we have methods now that are very good for estimating population size and doing uh, population arithmetic. That means if you go back, there was very little data available on natural populations before the 1950s. And so there have been major improvements in all these methods which underlie all the talks that you're going to hear. <clears throat> so I wanted to make that very clear. We won't talk about methods, but the data come from somewhere. Now, population regulation has two central questions that we have to address. Uh, the first is what stops population growth and clearly it's converse, is what stops population decline. And then we need to know why. Populations do, are change in size, and we'll give you several examples of that, but there are many out there now, many very good works. And, and we want to know why population growth changes from plus to minus. And then the other question, which I won't spend very much time on, is what factors determine the average abundance of a population? Uh, you know if you go out looking for, let's say, white-tailed deer or volcano rabbits, you know where to go, and you know that some areas are better than other areas. The average abundance of a population depends on a whole lot of things from what plants are available, the temp the climate, and so on. Now, both, the point is both of these questions require mechanisms, and I'll talk a great deal about population mechanisms, mechanisms that are changing population growth rates. So here's just a simple example, the whooping crane. Um, it was a recovery of North America's largest bird, a very large crane. It, it, it uh, breeds in central Canada, far up to the north. And around 1940, uh, there were about 20, 18 or 20 of these guys left. They wintered down in Texas, down in the southern US. And they were overhunted, okay? They were shot by hunters. So they're a great big bird and probably good to eat. So in 1940, it was protected. And since then, this bird has recovered. And so you can see the curve. Here's the population growth. Now it's gone up now to over 400, as I remember. And there's been a great deal of work on the conservation of this bird to try to protect it. But we know it's looking at it it will not go on increasing forever. It's up somewhere around 400 now, and it may get to be more. It's never going to be very abundant, but it's going to be saved from extinction. So here's a question. What, what caused this? What happened that allowed this? Clearly, in this case, it was protected from hunting. Now, here's a sadder case, the orange-bellied parrot, this beautiful little bird, uh, which uh, lives in southern, uh, southeastern Australia. And these are data for the last 35 years. And you can see it's not a very good story. This beautiful bird, uh, which uh, nests, uh, breeds down in Tasmania, uh, off of the south coast, and, and overwinters up on the mainland of southern Australia. It's been going down, 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 down. Um, and a few more years here, it's very nearly down at zero. So this bird is uh, in serious trouble and they have a captive breeding program to try to turn this around. But we need to ask, be able to ask and answer the question, why is this thing uh, going down like this continuously as uh, many other uh, populations on Earth? And so how do we study these kinds of issues? Now, for some of these uh, slides, you'll notice I put a reference at the bottom of them, not always there, but for students who may want to look up details of some of these points, uh, you could look these references up, but they're not needed for the message I'm going to give you today. Now, here's the essence of population ecology. We have a population that some time, some year, if you like, time t on the left here, and, and then it undergoes a growth rate and comes out the other side of the population size at time, the, next, the next year, say, or the next month. And, and then this is the key thing we want to start worrying about. What's, what's affecting that? Well, two things affect it, which you will all know. Uh, there's births and immigration, which drive numbers up. And there's deaths and immigration, which drive them down. Now, this very simple, uh, uh, if you like, the synthesis of what population ecologists worry about is, uh, is simple, but to work it out requires a lot of detail. And that's because these are the things that are causing births and deaths to change. The climate's changing. That's a serious problem now, as you all know. The predation issue, 
they're competition with species that are competing for the same foods or the same space. There's a food shortage in some animals uh, or nutrients for plants, soil, a nutrient soil structure. Disease, of course, again, we have COVID on our doorstep now for at least people. And then social factors, territoriality. So these are things I will come back to uh, in this lecture and the next one I give. So these, this is the nexus, if you like, of population ecology. And now the key thing that, uh, again, I want to emphasize to you is very many talented people have worked out the arithmetic of this. Population ecology has an arithmetic. And we can see that, obviously, when we worry about the human population, we can put numbers on all of these things. And that's very important. We cannot make progress in ecology without mathematics, without very good statistical methods and, and, and modeling methods. So all of this, again, is underlined by a whole lot of very talented people. So this is the thing we're trying to get at in different species now, and we'll give you several examples of this. Now, I want to go back about 50 years, if you like, and, and talk about the simple model of population regulation that was taught to you, and it's probably still taught to some people. What we have here on the x-axis is population density. And on the y-axis, either the birth or the death rate, and it's per individual in the population. And so we have here a very simple model. The death rate in this particular hypothetical example, the death rate goes up, this population density goes up, and conversely, the red line, the birth rate goes down as population uh, density rises. Now, where these lines cross is an equilibrium point. This is the equilibrium density. And if these curves for any population do not cross, uh, we're in real trouble because either the population will increase to a very large number uh, or it will go extinct. And so this if it's a very simple model that we want to start with and which we started with 50 odd years ago, uh, the equilibrium between births and deaths. Now, this model is uh, elaborated a little more because we talk now about whether the, the birth and de or death rate change with population density. So these get a bit of jargon here. The density dependent rate is a rate that has a line has a slope. And in this, again, hypothetical example, uh, the birth rate is going down uh, as population density goes up. But you could also have density independent rates as they're called, again, more jargon, but it simply means that the death rate is not affected at all as the population density changes from small to large. So again, these are possibilities, and this is what uh, early on population ecologists worried a great deal about. Uh, where is this equilibrium point uh, between births and deaths? Now, there's another interesting thing here which will come up later in our talks. Uh, you'll notice that we have completely now forgotten about immigration and emigration, that is to say animals coming into the population from outside or animals moving out of the population to go somewhere else. The early assumption was immigration and emigration are, are cancel each other out and they are not really needed to be worried about. And we'll show you data later on in the lectures that that's a faulty assumption, but this simple model ignores immigration and emigration. So this is what I call the equilibrium view of the world. It is basically describes how birth and death rates are related to population density. And, and the key then is always density dependence. The lines which I showed you have to have some slope to them. If they don't go up or go down, um, this is, um, we're gonna be in trouble. Okay, but problems arise right away with this very simple model. And I just wanna illustrate to you a couple of these. Um, the first of all is the equilibrium view, and this is again data now is accumulating in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. This graph here, uh, many populations show no sign of an equilibrium. So where is this magic equilibrium? We, we have an equilibrium view of the world. You can call it the balance of nature if you like, but this view of the world, and when you go out and look for it with any population, you see anything but an equilibrium for many or most populations. And so the other problem with this uh, view is that population density, which is the variable here on the x-axis that you're plotting everything against, 
is a shorthand. It's nice to know the density. We need to know that. But it's not a cause. That is, it's not a mechanism of change. And conservation is not possible or wildlife management is not possible unless we understand the mechanisms of change. And population density by itself is not a mechanism. Food shortage is a mechanism. Disease is a mechanism, those sorts of things. But population density is a, a nice shorthand, but to get, get to the meat of the issue, the essence of the issue, you've got to understand the mechanisms of change. And that message will come up again and again. So here's the second complication. Um, we start over here. Here's the simple model I gave you on the left. Now we have, again, per capita birth or death rates uh, against population density. Again, the very simple model. This is what the world is supposed to look like if you were looking 40 or 50 years ago. There's a nice equilibrium point. You know, the problem is now solved. But when you go out uh, into the real world, you start to see this kind of situation. Now the, the points, your data that you get for your population do not sit nicely on a line. They have, they have some sort of a trend, but it's pretty sloppy. Um, and so you get an equilibrium zone, but it's not very, not a point on the graph. But it, when you go out into the real world a lot of time, there is no equilibrium at all. The, the data you get relating population density to birth or death rate looks like somebody fired a shotgun at it. The points are all over the place. There is no equilibrium in evidence. And so you're barking, so to speak, up the wrong tree if you're trying to push this simple model, the equilibrium model, uh, it just breaks down in most cases, in many cases anyway, when you go out into the real world. So that's the case I'll be largely talking about. So, so this is elegant theory. So and this is, uh, I think, if you like the story of ecology, we have lots of elegant theory. And on the other hand, we have a lot of messy reality. And it's reality we need to get to, particularly if you're going to do wildlife management, if you're going to do conservation biology, you know, need to know what the reality is. You can get a nice uh, hypothetical model, but if it doesn't fit the real world, you're in trouble. Okay, let's have an example to show you that. Here's the mallard duck, which you have down, as I understand, it's all over North America and down into Central and even Northern South America. So it's a very common duck. And it's been studied a great deal because people like to hunt for ducks in, in North America, uh, both in the US and Canada, and I, I would guess in Mexico. And so we have a wildlife management problem. And so we, we look, we apply this simple model. We look at the survival rate. This is one bit of the data. And there's very much data. And many people have worked on this uh, to get all these data. This is the annual survival rate, OK? So if it goes down, then it's surviving less well. And here's the population size. Now, this is millions of birds, um, in fact, billions of birds, because they're doing all of North America, that is to say, all of the US and Canada. So they're adding all that together uh, because they need to set hunting regulations. But anyway, you can look at the graph and you see, well, there's a trend, you know, the survival tends to go down uh, with the population size. And there are more birds around. Um, so, but it's not a very good uh, relationship. I mean, you wouldn't want to put your money in the stock market if it looked this bad. So what are you going to say? It's not very predictive. If you, if you know uh, what the population size is, uh, it's not very good to try to predict what the survival rate is. And so that's uh, an example, I think, of where it, this equilibrium model is not very good. And so it's, it's survival is indeed density dependent, we would say, um, because it falls as population size increases, but it's very weak. And it's, so it's not very good if you want a predictive model. So, so these scientists work very hard to, to produce a model. And here's the Mallard population changes for the last uh, 25 years. Um, the green points are the actual ones and the, and the um, the model values uh, are in shaded here. But anyway, you can see there's an enormous fluctuation from over tens of uh, millions of birds down to around five to six million. Uh, and then now they're coming back up again. And so here's uh, the population. Now, an ecologist wants to know why. Why is this population changing? You know, 
that it's not an equilibrium population. Certainly, if it was equilibrium, the hunting regulations would be very simple. But clearly, you have to have different hunting regulations when it's high versus when it's low. And so you need to have a predictive model. You need to know the mechanism, if you like, of these population changes. Well, this is, uh, leads me to a second view of population change. The equilibrium view I've just described, this is the balance of nature. And I would really say in, in the 1850s to about the 1970s, this was a view of the world. We had stability was the rule and anything that wasn't stable was kind of put away as something unusual. But it's now largely changed since the 1970s into what I would call the non-equilibrium view of the world. That is to say, change is very common. This change is common in populations. This change, change is common in communities and ecosystems. And we need to understand the causes of change. And these causes are what we call mechanisms. So that's the, the view which you will get in, in these talks very much. You'll see a lot of examples of this non-equilibrium view of the world, which may, means things are harder. Okay, they're more difficult. If we if this equilibrium view operated, then we would have a very simple thing. And so this is why I, I say when I give these kinds of lectures that the equilibrium view is the view of chemistry and physics. You have basic laws that never change. The non-equilibrium view is the is the field of ecology. It's much more difficult to do than physics and chemistry because the world is changing all the time because all these populations we'll hear about and we talk about and you read about are changing because the world is changing. Okay, so out the window with that view of the world, in my opinion. Now, here's the comprehensive theory that says, look, we have these things I just talked about, the mechanisms, the predators, food supply, diseases, parasites, weather, shelter. Um, and then we have a population over here, and this, we're talking usually in this case about a single species. And you have to realize that as people are, do now that there's variation, there are different sexes, obviously, different age classes, the physiology of different individuals is different, their behavior may be different, their genetics of which we can now study very carefully is, is often different too. So not everybody in the population, and I don't need to tell you this, not everybody is the same. So when we talk about a population, again, we have a lot of heterogeneity here to uh, relate to these, these uh, mechanisms which cause change. So the ecologists spend a great deal of time worrying about which of these are the relevant ones for any particular population. Okay, so these are what we call individual differences. And again, there are things which are familiar to all of you, but there's an awful lot of work involved in sorting them out. Okay, let me give you an example of, uh, of one of our one of the problems of, of this uh, century, in the last century rather, the European rabbit in Australia. Now, the European rabbit is a colossal pest. I don't have to show you this picture to to um, to convince you of that. In 1859, it was brought into southern Australia. It was going to be a, a port for hunters to shoot, and of course, it got away and spread. There are no predators there to eat it are very few predators, and so you get scenes like this. So it very rapidly became a pest, and it was one of the great agricultural pests of Australia. So here we have an introduced pest. What can we do about it? We need to understand what controls its population uh, and, and how to change it. Well, what uh, fortunately came along was a disease called myxomatosis. It's a virus disease. And it was well known from colonies of rabbits, which are, of course, used for medical research and people would keep for, pet, for pets. Uh, and myxomatosis, uh, if it gets into a laboratory colony, kills all the rabbits or almost all of them. And so people in Australia said, why don't we introduce this out into the wild and see if we can uh, take care of all these rabbits and the farmers will be happy as a pest to remove. Well, in 1951, long ago now, uh, on a particular study area, you, they could count around 5,000 rabbits. They were just, uh, I mean, incredible numbers of rabbits. And they would, of course, eat all the forage that they would like to use for the sheep and the cows. And so they introduced uh, myxomatosis, which is a disease spread by mosquitoes and flies, um, uh, blood-sucking insects. 
And so there was an initial epidemic at the end of 1951, which killed 99% of the rabbits. I mean, these are cute little rabbits. You don't like to kill them, but look, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So the farmers, of course, who were very depressed up here, were very, very happy down here. The rabbits uh, became very common. They came back a little bit. Um, but uh, here is a case where the disease uh, did great help for the farming community. But a complication comes in right away. And so they kept studying this disease. And this on the x-axis here, the number of epidemics since the virus was released. So here's 1951. Each of these is a year apart. There was an, one epidemic a year, basically. So this is in the 1950s. And so what they did was look at the mortality rate of the rabbits caused by this myxomatosis disease. And you see they started way up here, 90, 95, 99%. So each of these points is a year in a couple of different study areas. And you can see what's happening here. As time goes on, uh, uh, the kill rate, if you like, of the disease, the mortality that the disease causes goes way, way down from 90 odd percent down to 20 percent and then later down to 10 and 5 percent. Now, killing 10 or 20 percent of the rabbits is still useful for the farmers, but this is uh, uh, kind of disappointing. Well, two things are happening. So here's evolution that comes in and it comes into Again, many ecological problems. Uh, evolution is happening for, in two ways. The rabbits are becoming immune to this. Okay, natural selection. Charles Darwin, back to 1859, said, here, you know, you're selecting for the guys who can resist this virus. And so rabbits become, you kill a lot of them, but you don't kill all of them. They become more resistant. The other thing interesting about this is the virus itself. And the interesting thing about viruses, as you can see now with our dealing with the COVID virus, is you can take the viruses, in this case of 1951, and put them in a freezer and pull them out 10 years later, or whatever, and put them through a laboratory colony of rabbits and see how lethal they are. So they kept doing that. So you have a constant in the sense of laboratory rabbits, which are not selected like wild rabbits. And over time, you can see the percentage killed by the virus is changing because the virus is changing. The virus is evolving to not kill so many rabbits. And why is that useful? Well, you can see again, the virus has to transmit from one rabbit to the next. If you kill everybody on the first day they get ill, you're not going to transmit anything. So you've got to prolong, if you like. You've got to have rabbits live longer and be less lethal so you transmit more. So there's an evolution between transmission and lethality in the virus. And again, this has been seen in many such systems. So evolution complicates ecology. The rabbit's more resistant, the virus is less lethal. So we're back to the simple model again. We think the world, here's now the rate of population growth of, again, a very simple thing. There's the zero line. Here's our magic equilibrium value. And down in here, the population is declining. Down in this pink zone, this is the bad place to be. And if you're up here, population density is lower. The population is supposed to increase. Now, that, as a model for conservation, is a total disaster. Okay? And so what I want to talk about here is the conservation dilemma that this really led to early on, because people realized you know, that when you got Animals got scarce when they got rare. They didn't necessarily increase rapidly. In fact, they went uh, extinct. So here's what's called the alley effect to complicate this. So here's the line we had, and here's our equilibrium point that we would expect the population to come to. And the graph I just showed you would have gone up like this, and everything would be rosy. But what happens in many cases, some cases, not all, in many cases, the line, in fact, turns down here into a zone shown in yellow here, uh, which is really an extinction zone because the population reaches <clears throat> what's called an unstable equilibrium, this point here. And once it gets there and goes into this yellow zone, it goes, the population goes to zero uh, to extinction. Uh, and if it gets above here, it can come back out. But there's a whole area here, depending on what species you're worried about, uh, where there's an alley effect and then with low population density, you go extinct, you don't go with um, increase rapidly. 
And so this extinction zone is clearly what conservation biologists have to worry about. And so that's why we worry about populations down in here that are going downhill. So now low populations then may continue to decline to extinction. So low population size is a kind of a warning sign. Well, here's an example of it. This is shearwaters in New Zealand. And shearwaters nest in colonies, and this is a logarithmic scale of colony size, uh, uh, 100,000 here, very big colonies over here, very tiny colonies of 150 here. And we're looking at breeding success. So, and you can see if you're in a big colony, you're really doing quite well, 60 odd percent of breeding success. But when you get down to tiny colonies, uh, 100, 250, whatever, somewhere down in here, you got terrible breeding success. In fact, you'll go extinct. So this is an alley effect uh, of low population size. And in this particular case, it's caused by a feral pig, pig predation introduced pest again on this island. And these islands, the pig uh, comes in and, and takes these uh, eggs and, and the young out of these nests where it won't go in here. There's too many birds here to, to beat it off. So here's an alley effect in the real world. So small populations don't always do well. So this led conservation biologists into two paradigms, which I want to just briefly talk about. The first is the small population paradigm. Uh, and that really says most populations out there in the real world are small. And what are the consequences of small population size? And that's a whole area of a lot of intensive research. And I'll give you an, one example in a minute here. And there's the declining population paradigm. So this is probably the main one the conservationists to deal with. And the declining population paradigm basically says we detect a decline in the species we're interested in. It's not declining. And then we diagnose the cause. This is just like a doctor looking for why you're sick. And then you halt the decline by some kind of effective management. So this is an action-oriented uh, paradigm, if you like, a way of going about studying. And, and so you've got to detect the decline, diagnose it, and then um, provide effective management. So all of that, again, requires a lot of wisdom about what you can and can't do. And this is a classic paper in conservation biology that discusses these uh, two. So let me just go through very briefly the small population paradigm. If you start up here, you have a small population. What happens with a small population is inbreeding and also random genetic drift, which you remember from your biology. And both of those lead to a loss of genetic variability. <clears throat> genetic variability, of course, is related to fitness. And when you lose genetic variability in general, the geneticists argue, you will reduce your fitness. Um, and that will fitness means lower reproduction, higher mortality. So both of these feed back and make the population even smaller. Uh, and so you go round and around into this. Again, it's an extinction vortex or it can be an extinction vortex if you lose genetic variability. Well, this can be a very useful thing to know if you have conservation issue, and that be just it's a loss of genetic variation, reduction in fitness, and then a decline in density, which can lead to extinction. Let me just give you an example of a successful reckoning. This is the prairie chicken. It's a grouse. It basically sits on the ground in grassland in central US. And in that part of the U.S., of course, the fields have all been plowed up for soybeans and corn, so there's not very much grassland left. And so people recognize, the biologists recognize this population was declining. So now we have to diagnose why is it declining? It's very steady on until the 1990s. And by 1992, they had measured genetic, from eggshells, you can measure the genetic uh, variability in this population it was going down, 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 just like the small population paradigm would predict. And so in 1992, they said, oh, what we can do now is bring in birds from Western states, from Kansas and Nebraska, several uh, hundreds of kilometers away, and introduce them into the population. That brings new genes into the population, uh, for both males and females. And you can see what happened once you put those birds into the population it started recovering, so it had more genetic variability 
and the population has really declined, uh, increased. So you basically rescued it, a genetic rescue, I guess you could call it, by bringing birds in, in this case, from other populations with other genetic uh, traits. So the small population paradigm, again, can as part of the conservation is a bag for rescue. Okay, so the declining population paradigm, and then back to it, detect, detect the decline. <clears throat> now you have to do that via monitoring. Monitoring becomes essential, so I'm always going on about monitoring, monitoring. You've got to know what's going on out there in the real world. And then you identify the causes of the decline, and that takes a lot of work, a lot of good natural history um, and other experiments. And then you specify detailed hypotheses. There may be several reasons why you think it's declining. And then you make predictions. And then you test these by doing experiments, uh, whatever kinds of experiments you can do, depending on the species. And then you take action. So action is what conservationists want. But you have to do that through this, if you like, detailed procedure. Other, if you don't do it with and find the causes of the decline, you're just often just uh, wasting your time and money uh, because you have to know what the mechanism is. And so we're back to mechanisms. Well, let me um, just give you one example, <laughs> another terrible example of uh, a, reco a recovery from um, <clears throat> Marion Island. Marion Island's out in the Indian Ocean, as you can see up here on the map. It's about halfway between South Africa uh, in Antarctica, about 2,000 kilometers out in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It's a big island. It's got about uh, 300 square kilometers, so it's not a tiny island, but it's incredibly isolated. And there were 12 species of petrels. Petrels are seabirds, and they were nesting on this island. They tend to nest on islands where they're protected from a lot of predators. Well, in 1948, uh, when the British took over, they decided that they needed to have some domestic cats on the island for pets. So they brought five cats onto the island. And they said, well, it was very good. They could, there were, of course, no cats on the island. And um, they wanted to control house mice. They said the cats would be very good for controlling house mice. And they did eat a few house mice. Uh, but by 1977, there were 3,000 cats on this island. Uh, they were killing 48,000 great ring petrels a year, and petrels were be and several species were now becoming very rare, and they were clearly going to go extinct if the cats had their way. So in that year, um, the British brought in a disease called feline panleukopenia, it's the fatal disease of cats, and, and it was introduced deliberately. Cats were reduced, but again, like the rabbits, you don't kill everybody, you knock them way down. And so by the mid 1980s, they had only several hundred cats left and they started shooting them. I know the cat lovers will not like this, but they shot the cats, they were an invasive species. And by 1991, there were no cats detected. So they had wiped out the cats, this invasive predator, a conservation success. And by 1992, already the petrels started to recover. And so they were saved from extinction from these, from the cat predation. But at the same time, they had also introduced house mice because the whalers had come there, this isolated island. So now you had house mice on the island uh, with no cats around and no other predators. And the house mice could start killing petrels, they're awful, nasty things. And so they went they going into uh, now getting rid of house mice on the island. Very difficult, but progress is being made as a whole story a whole seminar we could give you on the success of eradicating house mice and rats, which have been introduced to a lot of oceanic islands with terrible results um, and, and have to be got rid of if you're going to have conservation. So here's again a story about introducing species, the, the typical story, introduce pests comes in, people think they're good and they turn in to be a disaster. But in this case, you can't do something about it. Well, what causes all these declines and extinction? Again, we can't go through all the cases, but the, the four general main reasons are overkill, uh, which is called fishing and hunting. You're hunting them to uh, very low numbers. And that's, oh, and these are guesses. These are guesses. People have made 10% of losses. And these are largely the larger animals. Uh, 
that get hunted and fished to extinction. Um, habitat destruction, a major, major cause of loss and, and habitat fragmentation, again, much written on this very serious problem, of course, in, uh, in the Amazon, it's been a problem in North America and it's a problem in Canada, it's a problem everywhere. Introduced species, I've just given you one example, there's a lot of the cases of loss were due to introduced species and the message is clear, don't do it, don't bring these things in. And then change of extinctions, that is very specialized species that have only one host or one uh, uh, prey, uh, they can go extinct if their host goes extinct. That's fairly rare, but it can happen. Well, let me give you an example, another example of, of the, the, this problem, uh, which is uh, human folly again. Uh, this is the northern cod. The northern cod is what fed Europe in the Middle Ages. Okay, they discovered cod off the east coast of Canada. Enormous numbers of cod. Um, and these are catches now from 1860, 150 years ago, uh, catches in thousands of tons. These are fish that are as long as your arm. Uh, when they're adults, these are big fish. Anyway, they were taking 300 to 400,000 tons quite happily. Uh, salted cod was, of course, a great thing until we got refrigeration. Anyway, there was a bit of an increase here, but the fishery went up and down. And um, then there was a war, uh, not World War II. And then over about 1960, late 1950s, uh, somebody decided that, look, there's so many cod out there, we ought to have even more fishing. So at the same time, the boats were getting more efficient, the nets were getting more efficient. So there was enormous increase in the fishery and the catch of the cod. <coughs> now, by some calculations, this was supposed to stimulate the economy. But the problem is the catch of the cod is always the big fish. Uh, the big fish are the ones who lay the most eggs. And so this went up for a while, and then it catastrophically collapsed. We don't have to show you that. And then people got optimistic again because they saw there were a lot of cod. And they started fishing heavily again, some terrible miscalculations, and they fished this population to certainly to commercial extinction. They stopped all fishing on it. Okay, so this is a ca catastrophic mistake in management uh, because they had not gauged the uh, harvest rate uh, to the proper population. So the, well, this re resulted in total closure, closure of the fishery. Eastern Canada went into a tailspin. It was a really major fishery, a major employer. And the prediction was now the fishery will cover over the next 25, 30 years. Well, that's right now. Uh, and they have not recovered. Okay, why is it not recovered? So this is, again, an awful lot of discussion. It's recovered very slowly as of last year. Um, and the question is, what is it? There's still a lot of fishing going on, even though does not get recorded because the fishing is all done near shore in small boats. Most of the fishing statistics come from very large boats offshore. And so the counting up the fishing catch has always been a bit of uh, issues. So there's been more fishing than there should be. Then there's gray seal predation and gray seals have become more abundant. They're not harvesting them and they eat cod. So you've got two causes, <coughs> excuse me, and much controversy, but the point is the fishery is basically non-existent now. A lot of people are out of work. Well, one more example of the fishery is just a spectacular one. Lake trout were a major freshwater fish in the Great Lakes in, in Central North America. And then they decided they wanted to bring oceanic ships into the Great Lakes. So they opened up ship canals so that these boats could go around the waterfalls and so on and get up into the Great Lakes. And this opened the Great Lakes to the sea, even though they're fresh water, the marine predators uh, could then come in. And the predator that came in was a sea lamprey. And it became established in fresh water uh, where it could thrive. It could thrive in salt water and in fresh water during the 1930s. And well, here's the, one of the examples of what happened. The sea lamprey uh, feeds on the lake trout, which again are a big fish, sort of roughly the length of your arm. These are millions of kilograms of the catch. It was a very, very big fishery. And this is just one of the Great Lakes. These are enormous lakes uh, up to about 1935, 1940, uh, when the lampreys started to really build up. 
and you can see a catastrophic collapse here, basically to near zero by 1960, and until they learned methods, they, they developed methods to control the sea lamprey. And then they spent some return, but not back to this uh, fishery of old. It is not uh, recovered. It's recovered somewhat, but not. So again, here's an introduced pest that feeds on uh, lake trout down with the fishery. Okay, one of the few last things I want to get to here is um, um, a, a dilemma, killing for conservation. Okay, so invasive species, can we reduce their impact? Well, invasive species like the sea lamprey I just showed you, they're very difficult to eradicate. So eradication can be done in some cases, requires a lot of money, very difficult, and you're far better to prevent colonization. So we've learned that, and you'll get that message, I think, from uh, many of the other talks. But the question I want to raise is native species that impact other native species. How do we manage these? Okay, so we don't mind killing cats on islands that don't belong there, or rats or mice. But what about native species that affect other native species? Now, how can you manage these uh, conservation impacts? And this is the thing that's being discussed uh, actively now. And I want to talk about this one case, Northern Spotted Owl, a big owl. I'll show you a picture of it in a moment. And it occurs up the, the uh, east coast, the west coast of the United States, up in the southern Canada. And I think it may get down to Mexico. But the United States biologists took these colored areas and started studying them for, <coughs> for 30 years, the spotted owl. Uh, they were going down, down, down in numbers. And they wanted to know what they could do uh, to stop it. Well, in the last 10 years of the study, what they did is talk, took populations in Washington, Oregon, and California, and they calculated their rate of change. Now, this graph is similar to the one we had before, but now this green line across the middle here, the dashed line, that's 1.0. That's the point of equilibrium. If you're below that line, it means you're going downhill. You're losing population. If you're above that line, you're good. You're increasing. So that's the equilibrium point that you can calculate. So they did these populations uh, for years and years. Now, what is happening here are two things. One is they're logging the forest. These, this is the owl, the northern spotted owl, the lower right here. It, it lives in old growth forests. And old growth forests are big trees. Big trees are dollar bills. Dollar bills are cut down. And so there's enormous pressure to cut down these trees, and so to speak. We'll leave a few of them around for the lovely birds. We don't leave very much, so the, they were losing habitat all the time. At the same time, the barred owl, which is an eastern, uh, eastern North American owl, again, a big owl. This is, a, again, half the size of your arm. This barred owl moved into the West Coast, and the barred owl kills this guy. So these, these are two native species. This one, the barred owl killing the, the northern spotted owl. And so what did they do? They set up a lovely experiment, which is what you have to do to answer these questions. Here's the <coughs> population for several years that was unmanipulated. There was nothing was done. Uh, the barred owl that was in with the spotted owl. You can see it's way down in the negative territory. It's losing population. And here's an area where they got out their shotguns and they shot these lovely birds. I know you shouldn't like to do that, but if you remove the barred owls by shooting them, the population of northern spotted owls increases. It's up into this zone up here that none of these have ever been able to get to. And so you, you run into a dilemma here, um, this kind of experiment. What do we do? Well, nobody wants to stop logging. That's number one problem. You can maybe deal with that. But the northern spotted owl declines can probably be stopped by killing barred owls, which is a natural invader. So you've got two native species, and you're going to kill one to save the other one. Now, now barred owls are everywhere within the range of the northern spotted owl. So if you're going to do this as a management technique, you've got to do it forever. And so this requires really some very serious thinking of what you're going to do or not do. And do you want to do this killing or not? And the uh, an ecologist cannot answer that question. That is a value judgment. That is a question for society to, 
answer all the ecologists can tell you this is what will happen if you do one thing versus another. So this is a dilemma of conservation. Now. The last thing I want to talk about is the human population. And uh, I think the point is, as many ecologists have pointed out, all of this applies to the humans as well. And no population can increase without limit, all right? If there is a law of ecology, there is one. And it's absolutely certain. And humans are no exception. And we want stable populations of humans. That's what we would like. And they can exist in two states. One is with very high birth rates and very high death rates. If these are equal, the population will be stable. Second can be low birth rates and low death rates. And this in general is what uh, we at least, uh, I think, want to get to. Uh, and the movement from uh, high birth rates into low birth rates is, is called the demographic transition. So I just want to illustrate that in a minute. Now, if you look at human population growth, you've probably all seen this graph. If you took this back to uh, 1000 BC, it would still just be a flat line here. There's virtually no population growth in the humans, uh, or at least very, very slow rate until around 1700. And then, of course, with uh, advances in technology and the beginning of advances in medicine, which uh, came very rapidly, by 1900, uh, we've been on this exponential growth. Where are we up somewhere around 8 billion? I'll give you the figure in a moment. So that's the curve. Now, if you project, here we are here in 2000. And 20 and have the projection of high fertility will go up to 17 billion. Uh, medium fertility, and this is where we are now, this is the current one, so will go up somewhere around 10 to 11 billion. If we had a low fertility, uh, we could go down and gradually to about six to seven billion. So these are choices, these are human choices uh, of what uh, we would like. These are projections. They're not predictions, they're choices that have to be made. Now, the demographic transition is interesting because you can, again, put it in a population context. And here is a graph which unfortunately only goes up to 2005. But of two countries, uh, Sweden and Mexico, this is the red is uh, the death rate and the blue is the birth rate. So you can see when the birth rate is above the death rate, population goes up. So all these colored areas, green for Sweden, blue for Mexico, um, that's the amount of population growth that's going on. So for Mexico, uh, during the 19, well, during the 1900s, really, it was an enormous rate of population growth because the, uh, the birth rate greatly exceeded the death rate. And this is modern medicine, so this is happening in many, many countries. And so what, what you have here for these countries is uh, for Mexico, 1.2% uh, increase right now, 1.2% increase per year. And I average 2.1 children per female. In Sweden, you have less than two, you have 1.8 and a very low rate of increase. Um, the increase really only comes from immigration. Well, these are what ha is happening to really all human uh, countries, all human cultures and populations. And, and these are the choices that we have to make. So the current human population, seven, almost eight billion, rate of increase, 1.1%. Now, I don't know what it's like in Mexico, but this rate of increase, increase if you start doing the calculations, is really quite serious. Uh, fertility rates, again, above two. And this raises the last question I want to raise, and that's the carrying capacity of the Earth. It raises the question, how many people can we have on Earth? Um, how, can the, how many people can the Earth support? And much, much discussion of this. And again, the ecologist's job and the agriculturalist's job is to present the data. There's no clear agreement. There's much discussion, but it has to be discussed. The best guess I can give you is what's called the ecological footprint. I think it, it's one way to look at this question of the carrying capacity of the Earth. And so what this does, and there's enormous literature again, which I don't have time to talk about, uh, is you look at each country, every country is a point on the graph, uh, and there's what they calculate as the available ecological capacity. So this is expressed in terms of hectares, so you convert everything, if you like, into agricultural land, and then you ask what the ecological footprint is, again, per person. 
Okay, and so here's the line where these are equal. So if you're above the line, if you're one of these red guys, um, you are basically using up more resources than you have available in your country. Well, how do these countries exist? They import. They import iron ore, they import oil, they import whatever. Um, and so you can see the US is sitting on the edge now. This is only one thing. The world sits here and current calculations. India and Pakistan are kind of right on the line. Now Canada, Australia, New Zealand are way over here. They got a lot of ecological capacity and they don't use it up. So they're on this side of the line. So uh, uh, and you want to know what the ecological capacity is. The carbon footprint is the largest part of human ecological footprint. So that's why we're worrying about the carbon cycle. That if you translate this into carbon dioxide kind of use, but the point is that a whole lot of countries on Earth subsist, and a lot of these are European, they subsist because they can import the food from Brazil, wherever, Australia, the United States. Okay, my last slide. No population increases without limits. And that is a law of the universe, and that is one we have to keep remembering. And the problem we have as ecologists is to find the mechanisms causing populations to change, whether they go up, where they go down, and that requires, again, a lot of experimental work. But with the experimental approach, I think we're making a lot of progress in the last 30, 40, 50 years. But remember the, my starting point almost, the devil is in the detail. That is to say, there is no universal law, if you like, uh, for every population. If you have a conservation problem, there is not a book you can go to and find the solution because Every population is somewhat different, and you, the devil is in the details of exactly what's happening, what's causing the population to change, what mechanisms are involved. And there's a lot of work going on on this, a lot of good work in conservation, wildlife management, but the devil is in the details. The details are very important, and they are not easy to come by. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Xavier. Este. Okay. Sorry. A bit slow here. Oh, golly, I went over time, didn't I? I think I talked too much, Carlos. No, that's, that's good. I, I can... Uh, Sabdiel, can you get me on? Sabdiel, me puedes prender la, el video? Sabdiel. Eh, no puedo, no puedo activar mi cámara. Yo tampoco. Este dice que el hospedador detuvo las cámaras. Sabdiel. Ahora sí. Thank you very much, Charlie. A really great introduction, really great overview of, uh, of population ecology with amazing examples, which I guess we very much relate to. Um, and uh, there is a there is a few questions, not not uh, not very many, but we have we have people from Argentina, from Peru, from Italy from Mexico, of course, from many places. Uh, they are very grateful for this. And um, I want to start with a, with a few questions. Uh, first, maybe the general ones, and then uh, a couple of uh, specific one. And I guess the first one is, um, it, it relates to your conclusion of the, that the details, the devil is on the details. And uh, the question is, is the devil becoming more complicated today with climate change? That's one. I'm, I'm going to do several so you can round them up. Uh, the other one is, um, has to do with how, how do you figure out what is the appropriate scale for studying populations? Uh, you, you have experience with that. Uh, on um, starting with the 
uh, areas that are small and then looking at the heterogeneity of large areas, how to figure out what is a good scale. And one more is that as populations become small, these populations that are in danger, it becomes more difficult to uh, monitor them, to estimate their populations. And uh, so maybe if you can tackle those first questions. Uh, remind me what the first one was, Carlos. If the, if the devil is becoming more complicated. Oh yes, uh, things are becoming more complicated, but still there are only, a, that's a good, very good question. There are only a finite number of things that happen in populations. And so uh, the first issue is you need to know an enormous amount of natural history if you're studying a particular plant or animal, you need to know, you know, what kind of soil it likes or whatever, where it lives, what it eats. And so natural history is a background for all of this. Without good natural history, you know, we're lost, okay? Um, so, and if you have to discover all of that, uh, it, it's an awful lot of work. That, and those are the details. But, you know, we always have some examples. Um, for example, if you're studying jaguars, you've got a whole lot of work on, on cats around the world, uh, wild cats around the world, that you can kind of draw out some possibilities for. So you certainly look to the literature to see what's been done in that particular area. Um, but sometimes uh, you have to make kind of guesses. Uh, but you, the conservation, of course, is you don't have an infinite amount of time to get all the details. You've got to do something, so it's got to be action oriented. Um, and it's better to do something uh, than it is to sit there and kind of think too much or build too many models. So that's my reaction. Now, when I say do something, uh, I think uh, what you have to uh, worry about all the time is uh, the, I would call it the Hippocratic Oath of Ecology, which is to say, do no harm, do not harm the environment. Uh, do. Uh, Buzz Holland used to say in our group, uh, don't do things that you cannot undo. Um, so now that's a bit too, too severe, but uh, you, you ought not to um, uh, do things that uh, really harm the environment seriously that will not reverse when you stop doing it. So what do you do? I think, it, 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 you know, again, it depends a lot on, on knowledge of natural history. And, and some guesses, and, and you can see some guesses are right, some are wrong, uh, that's, that's going to be the case. Um, but I think it's really important to have targets, if you like. You're going to do this for five years, two years, one year, whatever it takes, 10 years. And then you're going to stop and say, what are we doing? What did we get out of this? But don't keep doing things forever. So um, now, that, again, that's perhaps not terribly useful, but um, I think you really need to know a lot of the details. Um, and this is causing problems, of course, with, uh, well, you can look at the COVID virus mess at the moment. Eh? Nobody knew anything about the COVID virus and look at how many people and how many dollars that it's taken to get to the point now where they're still arguing about all sorts of things about how far you can transmit it by uh, speaking loudly or whatever. Anyway, um, now, the scale issue is, again, it's tied to the organism. So I would say it's easy for mammals uh, and birds uh, that have some kind of home range or territory, because if you want to study population dynamics, you can't just have it on one home range or one territory. You've got to have a, a, a larger area. And I, but I think the message has always been uh, <laughs> another semi-law of ecology is that the study area is never large enough. And we are always limited by the fact that we have one research assistant, two, whatever. If you're very wealthy, you might have a whole lot of them. Um, but we often don't have enough people to do the size of areas we would like. So we have to do things collaboratively. That helps to get more people out there. Uh, so I say, to take, a, here, take the area you think you might need and probably double it or triple it and then try that. But it has to be feasible. Of course, you've got to do measurements. And so, uh, but it's really important, I think, there's a strong, strong message that we always do things on too small a scale. 
and I'm sorry, uh, I am always complaining about plant ecologists that always do things on too small a scale, but uh, they're getting better, it's getting better. But it requires a lot of money, money is the resource in short supply. Thank you, thank you. There is a couple of questions that have to do with evolution. One is that, uh, how can we consider factors like speciation in the population? Uh, is it possible to detect uh, changes in the relation between deaths and births with, with the data? I guess that's kind of uh, a bit oriented towards the studies of, of grant, of the grants in the, in the Galapagos. And, and one more is, uh, People want to know more about the example of the rabbits, the relation of the virus and the resistance to, to it. Um, um, so, so the, <clears throat> where will I start here? The genetics, the genetics, I think, geneticists are in a terrible bind. I would say intellectual bind. Um, and it, this is all in my opinion. They have now the means to sequence everything on earth, okay? I mean, if you get the money, how can you can do that? The question is, of what value is that for wildlife management and conservation? Now, it may be of great value, but I think the value is going to be 50 years down the line. It's not going to help the next five or 10 years when we have a real crunch. And so I, I think it's important for geneticists, ecological geneticists, to try to follow on with their ideas about how genetic changes may int uh, integrate with population changes. But I think that sorting that out is a, you know, a problem that'll be 50 years in the making. And so now there are a lot of models about genetics, an awful lot of models. And I think they make predictions which are absolutely untestable. And, and I don't like that. I mean, you can make all the predictions you want, but you know, to tell me that uh, we will have uh, certain kinds of trees growing in Northern Canada in a thousand years is not very helpful to me. I'm not gonna be here in a thousand years. So um, um, now this all gets tied up with climate change. It's another really, if you like, confusing issue because what we would like to do is say, let's get the paleontologists here. They can figure out from the pollen diagrams and whatever, what was happening in the last thousand years or 10,000 years. And then we just draw a line through that and keep it going and we extrapolate to the next thousand years. Well, that doesn't work anymore because the climate's changing so rapidly. So all the insights of the past are valuable, but they're really only a rough guide to what might happen in the future. So I think one has to look and say, Look, guys, the fact that you've got, and this is true of almost anything that's related to climate, the fact that you got this kind of a relationship 20 years ago doesn't mean 20 years from now that's going to be the same one that we're going to see. And so it means repeating a lot of uh, studies. And I think it's another issue repeatability. You know, if, if you have studied species X, Nobody else should study it because you know everything there is to know about it. And that's crazy because species X may change in the next 20 years or may have changed since that study was done. So I think climate change is a really real fly in the ointment. It's a devil in the details and it's changing things slowly. Okay, so if I make some predictions in the next five years, I don't know if you can ever see um, these any change that it, maybe you could, but you'd be very lucky to. And then you say, well, how long is an average human research cycle? You know, maybe it's uh, 30 years, 20 years. I mean, this is, you know, you look at the geologists and they would just laugh. You know, they say that's such a tiny bit of time, you know, <laughs> that you expect to see a, a, a big change. Uh, but that doesn't mean the change isn't happening. We should try to understand it. But I think we should be very humble about going forward, both with uh, evolutionary suggested changes. And this comes down to very practical issues. Well, the simplest one in Canada is the uh, trees. You know, it's getting uh, warmer in the Arctic and cold, uh, sorry, hotter in the south and, and warmer in the north. So we got a whole set of trees adapted to southern United States. 
and uh, they're going to all die out because it's going to, the weather, the climate's going to be impossible. So let's take those trees and transplant them up to Canada, where it's going to be uh, warmer up there. They couldn't live now, but maybe in 20 years they'll live happily. So, so you're monkeying around. You need a lot of experimental work, I think, to justify that. Dr. Sarukan, do you want to uh, have a question? No, I, I have I have expressions of a beautiful talk that went from the very very basics to the complicated, even morally difficult issues of how do you control population, human populations which was really a phenomenal breadth of the, of the talk. Uh, no, it, it was delightful. I, 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 don't, I don't have any particular questions. Well, some of the questions were, uh, I mean, of, of the, the kind of things that already uh, Dr. Krebs uh, commented. It depends what you want to do with it. I mean, is, is it a matter of, of, of using um, or utilizing the population for commercial purposes, for, for uh, biological uh, reasons, for issues that have to do with protection of uh, endangered species. One, one has to be very clear from the beginning what is what one wants to do. Uh, and uh, one of the things, uh, having worked with buttercup populations <laughs> many years back, uh, counting plant by plant. Uh, I know that this is a very time consuming issue. And if you don't have a, a very specific question, and mine was to see what regulated the size of the populations of the, but, of the three species of buttercups, uh, then it, it, it becomes, a, I'm going to use a, a very strong word, becomes a useless uh, enterprise. You, I think that one, yes, one, one needs to solve a biological issue, problem, but also to produce information that has some use that can be applied to something and can be really helpful to solve a problem, to better a situation. And, and this is something that sometimes is lost in, in, in this area. And as Professor Krebs mentioned, one of the, the, the main elements to understand stability, change, and, and uh, the risk of populations is based on, on population studies that have to do with all the issues that affect mortality, uh, mortality rates, natality rates, etc. And this is very time consuming. So one, one has to have a very clear uh, uh, purpose for devoting time, money, people's time, and, and intellect into into this. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I am absolutely convinced that without all the elements that combine into making a population stable or non-stable is the only way to, to be able to manage, preserve, improve the size of a population or the conditions of a population. So I, I think it was a, a wonderful talk. Uh, I, I, my humble opinion and thanks to uh, Professor Krebs for such a really nice, delightful, clear talk. Thank you. I, I will uh, just think, uh, uh, 
uh, announced that we're going to continue with this series. This is the first of six uh, talks. This is the int regenerative introduction. We will go into more detail every Thursday at five o'clock here in Mexico City's time. Next, we will have uh, Dr. Judith Myers talking about uh, biological control of insects and weeds, which is uh, another part of uh, applied population ecology. And uh, so we will hope that everyone joins again. We thank everyone for being here, particularly Dr. Krebs, thank you for your commitment to uh, population ecology and for uh, helping us to organize this series, which I think are going to be great starting from today. Thank you. And we say uh, goodbye to everyone else. These uh, seminars will be translated too and will be in our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, this talk is uh, probably going to be already up there very soon. Thank you, Charlie. Good afternoon in Canada. Good, uh, good night, Dr. Sarukan. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will see you next week. See next you next week. Also. Yes. Bye-bye. <laughs> All right.